I first would like to call Nikita Grigorovich. Uh, Nikita Grigorovich is a Polish Belarusian journalist and a member of the board of the, uh, the Free Belarusian Initiative, which is a non-governmental non organization gathering young activists supporting the development of democracy in European countries. And Nikita will talk about the peaceful revolution and struggles for democracies in Belarus. Nikita, I welcome you. Um, please take over uh, the talking stick. Uh, you will also uh, share a slide with us. Uh, welcome. Hello. Mm, hello. It's me. Uh, my name is Nikita, as it was said. I'm, I'm uh, an activist of Free Belarus uh, Initiative, uh, which is based in Warsaw, but we are focusing on uh, helping Belarus. Now I will uh, change to the presentation and uh, share it with you. Um, let me start it. One second. Okay, uh, I hope you see it uh, correctly. Okay, so um, obviously I'm going to talk uh, with you uh, about uh, about Belarus and the uh, Belarusian Revolution of Dignity, how it's called in Belarus, uh, which you may have heard about in August. Um, now it has been over 100 days of uh, both tragic and stunning struggle for, for the right to decide simply. However, um, you may have heard about it in August, but it started way earlier in, uh, in the midst of pandemic in April. Uh, it started. Uh, it started with um, Lukashenko's Danielism, actually, uh, and uh, through through his Danielism, he pushed Belarusians to create a, a parallel health system uh, because uh, Belarusians realized that uh, they must um, they must act and be active in order to protect themselves uh, to simply survive. Uh, moreover, they they had seen that uh, they realized that uh, that the regime is not only passive or absent uh, in the time of need, but it's also standing in a way uh, of surviving, uh, of uh, of securing basic uh, basic needs. Um, and through this creation of of parallel health system, uh, self-organized bottom-up structure. Uh, of helping each other, the Russians uh, realized that uh, that they can be uh, active society, that they can help themselves and they can provide each other uh, what state uh, under Lukashenko's role is not able to provide to them. And uh, before pandemic, the Russians knew that they were oppressed and they lacked freedom, but they believed in, uh, in state narrative uh, of stability of risks uh, and through, um, through propaganda which flooded them with, uh, with tragic images, manipulated images, uh, which were, were, what point where is uh, to, to scare them and to make them afraid of any changes. Uh, even though the propaganda worked for so many years uh, through internet and through the coming of new generation, uh, Belarusians slowly but surely uh, changed their mentality. And this new generation with uh, the upcoming uh, elections were able to seize the moment and to give voice to them, uh, to those who were uh, unheard before. So the youngs themselves and to women as well. And the second part is uh, very important is in Belarus because uh, under the leadership of uh, three women, uh, Svetlana Cichanowska, Maria Kolesnikova and Veronika Cepkalo, they were able to, uh, to unite because those three women addressed uh, almost every group uh, in Belarus. Almost every group, it means that uh, everybody was moved but, uh, by what they uh, shared and by their stories. Uh, Cichanowska identified herself as a housewife, while uh, Kalesnikova lived abroad for some time and came back to Belarus. 
and uh, on the other hand, Sepkalo was a successful IT manager. So together they were they were able to to create a simple but uh, taunting uh, message to to Belarusians that their right to decide is about to come finally, and Belarusians believed it. Unfortunately, one of Belarusians did not believe that, and this 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 man was. Uh, was Lukashenko, as you may know. Uh, he refused to understand what is happening in Belarus and decided to start a reign of terror, a terror which is uh, comparable to what happened in the 30s of the 20th century in Nazi Germany or in Stalin's Soviet Union. It may seem exaggerated to you uh, because these are strong words, but this is true. Uh, over 30,000 detained people over three months. Tens uh, were killed, some are missing still. And, uh, and uh, so many were, were hurt really bad. Um, even though uh, this terror continued, Belarusians were able to, to somehow survive and to somehow keep struggling for, for democracy. I would love to explain you how they are doing it. And I would love to hear your ideas, how, how they can, uh, how they can prevail. So I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nikita. Uh, also for the powerful pictures uh, you presented there. And uh, unfortunately, I won't be in the breakout session. Uh, I will moderate uh, another one, which I'm also very much looking forward. Um, but thank you for giving us, also stay in time, uh, giving us a little intro on what we will be changing later on in the breakout session. I now would like to call Ola Karacek and Jakub Obanek. Ola Karoshek is a member of the board of Love Does Not Exclude Association, and Jakub Obanek is a supporter of that association and at the same time also a lecturer at the University of Warsaw. Um, they will present the current events in Poland related to the so called LGBTI free zones and the constructive response of the community in Poland to the homophobic declarations uh, spread wide. By political elites. Um, I both see you. Yes, okay, you're there. Thank you for uh, taking the word and also uh, sharing your screen with us. Please, Ola. Yeah, sure. Hello. Hi, my name is Ola Kaczorek. And uh, we will actually uh, talk about a little bit broader uh, spectrum of, uh, of the events. Um, so we have uh, split up uh, the presentation into two parts uh, and I will start my part. So let me just share my screen uh, and I will um, talk about, um, okay, I'll share. Uh, I will talk about um, the situation uh, of the LGBT plus community in Poland. Just a second. Uh, okay. and show me the full screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will talk about the situation in Poland. Um, the whole community is, I'm sorry for the view. Oh yeah, here I can see the view and uh, full screen mode. Okay, so hopefully you can see what I can see. Um, so the brief summary, and forgive me for reading out uh, what I have to say, because the, um, there are so many elements that it's really hard to, you know, cram them uh, into, in, into the five minute limits. Uh, so I will just uh, read it up and, and follow it up with some of the information and then Kuba will take over. Um, so LGBT plus rights in Poland, um, it's a brief summary. So we've got no same sex partnership recognition whatsoever. Um, children can't officially have two parents of the same sex. Um, 
we've got no anti uh, hate crime or anti hate speech protection. Um, we've got we have um, the ability to transition, but it's a long and often humiliating process. Uh, we've got no anti discrimination laws aiming directly at the problems of the LGBT plus community, except for the um, work uh, related laws. Um, we've got no bans on so called conversion therapies. Um, Hola, we've just got Excuse me. Yeah. Um, it looks like the screen of your presentation is frozen because we still see the first uh, slide. Oh, okay. So perhaps you need to go back into the mode you were before because then sure. you could see what you were doing. Thank you. Yes. Is it better now? Yeah. Much cool. better. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, so we've got, yeah, it will be easier for you now to follow the, um, the stream of, of, uh, of words that I'm spewing out. Um, no ban on so-called conversion therapies. Um, there are medical, uh, medical procedures um, on intersex children right after their birth. Um, no anti-discrimination procedures uh, concerning LGBT plus people implemented at schools and public institution. We've got uh, no sex education, nothing like this. Um, and the situation, uh, social and political situation um, this year, we've got continuous hate campaign led by the ruling party and their supporters. So there are uh, public media, fueling the hostility towards the LGBT plus community. We are scapegoated. We are shown as the main threat to the healthy society. Uh, far right organizations are gaining power and recognition and are um, recognized by the state. Um, there are everyday assaults happening on the streets, but also violent attacks on the pride marches when they were taking place. This, of course, this year, uh, there was only one, uh, one march um, because of the pandemics. And there are detentions and arrests of the activists, and um, it's been happening uh, more often since um, August this year, um, since the riots, we can call them riots in Warsaw. And there are um, LGBT free zones, so uh, anti LGBT resolutions held by the local governments um, that are changing their um, administrative uh, areas uh, into those LGBT free zones. So uh, as the LGBT plus organization, we've got um, lots to do uh, and lots on our plate. Um, here you can see Bart Staszewski with his um, LGBT free zone um, sign that he travels around Poland with and uh, puts it up on different uh, signs um, signifying the different cities that took out those uh, resolutions. Um, and you can see the riots in um, August this year uh, that police were uh, brutally uh, pacifying, as they are calling it. So um, during the breakout session, uh, I would love to talk more about the whole situation and our approach to tackle this, um, this conundrum that we are in. Uh, and now <laughs> I will pass my voice to uh, Kuba, who will talk more about the um, it's a different approach, not so, um, not a street approach, but the, the, the different kind of approach. So, Kuba, here we go. Um, so, I have, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll be very quick. So, since uh, I'm a lawyer, um, uh, the, my approach is uh, a slightly uh, less street, street, street approach. We, we uh, were also implying law as a tool for the activism or uh, advocacy for LGBTQ uh, rights as part of human rights in general. This you have already seen uh, in Ola's part, so we can uh, immediately go to the next slide um, showing what is being done. So first and foremost, uh, some strategic litigation, but we also need to remember that these cases are human individuals cases. So every strategic case has got a human problem behind them. And they aim both at protecting the rights of the community as much as the rights of a, of a particular individual. Uh, there are almost, uh, there are about 19 cases pending in the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which 
in a way, one way or another, refer to the marriage equality problem uh, or some recognition of same-sex partnership, we could call them the polish Oliari and Co. Then we've got cases that have been already won uh, um, um, in different ways, uh, something failed, something won, uh, uh, trying to confirm at least part of the parental rights of same-sex couples, uh, that's transcription of foreign birth certificates, and some attempts at trans confirmation of post citizenship for, for these children. So basically it's the post citizenship that has been confirmed or has been ordered to be confirmed rather than the actual transcription of the act of birth. Then, uh, as Ola uh, ha, have mentioned, it, there is no um, uh, protection against hate speech uh, directed against uh, uh, sexual orientation. So we try to um, um, instrumentalize criminal law for that and, and civil law uh, trying to sue uh, for uh, defamation. And you can see on the picture, one of these trials with me standing the witness box, it was Bart Staszewski's trial uh, versus a town council of the city of Lublin. And uh, also trying to use the civil law protection of uh, personal rights. Uh, one of those cases is the uh, free zone, uh, LGBT free zone sticker case, and uh, we got a successful injunction issued by the court against the stickers and an ad hoc advocacy. The problems with that, which we'll probably discuss further at the breakout sessions, is that there is an expert knowledge needed, time and money consuming. It's not done immediately. We have to wait for the for the for the result. And above all, as with other things in Poland, uh, the big question here is the challenge to the rule of law uh, um, uh, and the courts in, in general. With the law. Uh, love does not exclude organization we have created this program of law does not exclude and and that somehow meets the the, the issues that have been discussed and uh, see you then in breakout sessions for the rest thank you thank you very much Jakub. Uh, also um, for bringing up the perspectives uh, from uh, law and lawyers perspective uh, which uh, also is uh, within the European Democracy Network, a topic that we could address a little bit more intensively, I believe, um, because uh, next to street activism, this is uh, another very important pillar um, to try to bring change forward. Um, thank you for uh, the story on current uh, stage in, in Poland. I now would like to invite Veronika Mora, uh, Veronika Mora is a co-founder of the Civilization Coalition and the directress of the Hungarian Environmental Partnership Foundation. Uh, she, will give, uh, she will give us uh, a little introduction on her perspective on the phenomena of shrinking civic space in Hungary and the constructive response of different civil society organizations across Hungary. Uh, Veronika, you have the word. Please also share the screen with us. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm really happy to be here and be able to share uh, the story of Hungarian civil society uh, in the last uh, decade. Um, Hungarian civil society organizations experienced the first uh, major attacks by the government uh, on their integrity during 2014 and 15. Um, and this um, conflict uh, focused on the so called. You know, um, uh, NGO program of the EA Norway grants. Uh, this was also a wake up call to civil society and had very distinct faces. It started with smear campaigns and vilification uh, of major human rights, anti corruption, LBGT, uh, and women organizations, continued with harassing uh, inspections by various state agencies with questionable legal grounds which later turned into criminal accusations culminating in a house raid at our offices uh, in September 2014, and uh, then um, continued in uh, long uh, court battles. While this conflict has been resolved at the end of uh, 2015 uh, with an agreement of the donors of this program and the Hungarian government, um, the smear campaigns and the vilifications continued with uh, high-ranking government officials, including the prime minister, making uh, denigrating uh, accusations of civil society organizations. Um, 
And also, and later in 2017, uh, the shrinking civil space um, uh, progressed uh, or reached new height uh, by introducing the first restrictive legislation, the so-called Act on Foreign Funded Organizations, stigmatizing uh, civil society organizations that receive money from uh, abroad. And a year later, uh, this was followed by the so-called Stop Soros legal package and the immigration tax, which specifically targeted civil society organizations uh, working with uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Of course, th there is much more to this story, uh, but I will be able to tell you about this uh, in the breakout sessions. So how did Hungarian civil society respond to these developments? In early 2017, about 30 major um, civil society organizations, including human rights, anti-corruption, environment, women and community development uh, groups came together for a series of discussions and brainstorming. And out of this, the Civilization Coalition was born. Uh, the coalition became well known uh, in uh, spring 2017 uh, when it made itself visible through a series of spectacular actions, where also its uh, logo, the Civil Heart, uh, was uh, created. Um, since then, the Civilization Coalition uh, works along four major uh, purposes or goals. One is to stand up for one another and to counter the trend of shrinking civil space in Hungary to defend uh, democracy in Hungary. Also to be uh, a platform of solidarity of exchange among members and among civil society organizations in order to make a response uh, to uh, further uh, shrinking of civil space more efficient and uh, faster. Um, it also aims at uh, improving or broadening the network, especially among urban and rural civil society organizations as the divide uh, between these two types uh, is very visible in Hungary, I guess, just like uh, elsewhere. And last but not least, through a variety of positive uh, communication campaigns aimed at improving the image uh, and the constituency and social support of civil society organizations. Uh, the way how and why it works, what makes it work, uh, I will tell or present more in the break-in session, and I'm looking forward to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, I now would like to call Clementina Suhana. Uh, Clementina is a writer, editor, translator, and activist. Uh, she's the co-founder of the movement All Poland Women Strike, and she will give us a little bit intro and tell us more about the massive protests and the women's revolution uh, that is happening right now in Poland. And so looking at uh, something that is happening right now. Clementina, uh, thank you. Uh, please take over the role and share the screen with us. So yes, since a month we have uh, some kind of revolution going on in Poland. Uh, it started with the women's issues with uh, new restrictions in abortion law. It was decided by the constitutional court um, that lateral illnesses, uh, terminal illnesses, are not um, part of the list uh, that allows for abortions in Poland. That provoked a huge uh, protest, uh, first because of this law, also because we are fighting for a liberalization of abortion since several years, and we used to say many times that we don't agree for any restrictions. However, the government decided to use the pandemic time to do it. So they did it. And since uh, the 22nd of October, we are on the streets almost like continuously every day. Um, in 2016, when the women's strike started, um, the parliament had an idea of introducing penalization for abortion. We were present in 150 places. Now it's over 600. So it's a huge uh, movement right now. Uh, it's happening in many towns little small places that have never seen any protest in the history probably of Poland and uh, <clears throat> it's called already uh, this uh, big wave of protest the biggest uh, in the Polish history and especially after 89 the fall of communism 
Um, very soon, we as women leading the protest, uh, we realized that there's a lot of other people, other sectors of the society who are joining us uh, because they also accumulated lots of frustration and anger towards the government about how they act, what they do, and so. Uh, so it, it, it has become actually a national uh, protest movement. Uh, today we have another uh, march uh, in Warsaw, but it's happening also in over 30 other places today in Poland, because today exactly is the anniversary of women um, getting voting rights. It happened in 1918, um, after the first war, when it ended, um, Polish women fought for voting rights and they were finally given them. So it's an anniversary, 102nd years of, um, of that happening. So we are again taking to the streets today. In, in recent weeks, um, I, let's say two weeks, we noticed um, um, like new, this, new orders in the police troops coming from the high ranks of the ministries. And uh, the reaction of the police is becoming harsher. And um, they started using tear gas. They started beating people last week. So we don't know exactly what to expect today on the streets. So we are getting ready for, for everything. We have um, legal help for people. We provide legal help for people. There's a special phone number people can call during the riots or afterwards in case of any problems. We have also psychological support for people social support for people. So we are quite organized and it's not that just people are walking there, risking their lives, but we have the whole apparatus behind that's ready because we've been on the streets since years. So we know how to do it. And we had lots of experiences that we are applying now on a larger scale to protect people that um, go with us. So this is in short, just a panorama. I don't have slides, anything to show you because I'm in a rush preparing to, for the march that starts at three o'clock, which is in like two, three hours. So this is my story for you today. <laughs> I mean, maybe I should add that people are uh, calling in very bold and cursed language words um, for the government to step away. So this is actually the street demand that it started with women's rights, but um, now it's about everything and people want this government to go away. Of course, the government doesn't want to step away, right? That's the situation. Thank you very much, Clementina. Um, and again, I want to, uh, to thank all of you for, um, for being with us, uh, knowing that you as a person actually are needed now in your communities and your groups uh, to continue the fight and uh, to, to prepare for future uh, activism. And so thank you again for being with us and also for being with us uh, later on in the breakout sessions. We really highly value that, thank you. And now, as we heard uh, four stories, <laughs> more from the perspective of civil society actors trying to fight the oppression uh, of the governments and standing up for uh, basic human rights, fundamental rights, democratic rights. In our last stories, uh, we want to go a little bit into uh, deeper into uh, um, a topic of uh, within the civil society, which is uh, inclusion and diversity. And I'm very happy that we have Diego Alvarez with us from Extension Rebellion. Um, uh, you all probably know um, that organization and the issues, he will talk also a little bit about it. And Diego uh, is an activist with Extension Rebellion and Camp Collapse Collective. Um, and he will focus a little bit in his presentations, um, do the social and climate movements in Europe have a problem with of inclusion and diversity uh, mainly highlighting the case from Extension Rebellion. Um, Diego, thank you very much for being with us and also uh, to promoting the issue of inclusion and diversity within the civil society movements and actors. Uh, it's your turn. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you for everybody that is going to present exactly what we need, which is uh, develop more civil uh, tissue and protect and defend and fight for our rights. Uh, I will now then uh, turn on the shared screen. 
and go into full mode, hopefully. There we go. So um, I will try to keep it for the five minutes. And um, do we have a problem of inclusion and diversity in our climate movements and general uh, social and civil movements in Europe? I can tell you from the experience that I've uh, gathered in a year uh, participating with Extinction Rebellion here in Germany, more, more precisely in Berlin. Um, but I would like to share with you these images. In the left side, you can see the critics, one of the critics we received after our first rebellion wave uh, last year in October. And on the other hand, another type of response to the same problem, which is trying to give some advice or trying to develop the question of uh, inclusion and diversity. So to the question, uh, are we uh, inclusive and diverse inside of Extinction Rebellion? I could show you this map and tell you that we're everywhere around the world. But I could also tell you that uh, when you can see is that we're mainly in Europe, in the United States, in old British colonies, and uh, that's it. I could also tell you that the white marks are for people that were doing demonstrations but were not doing civil disobedience because of obvious reasons of being afraid or the possibility of being taken by the police very aggressively and even incarcerated or killed. Uh, I could show you this picture where I, de I definitely took a picture from India, Extinction Rebellion, and tell you, look, we're diverse. But to be honest with you, I, I have to say that I don't think the problem itself is, is Extinction Rebellion diverse or not. I can tell you that we've seen the barriers. Uh, we've tried to, we've tried to uh, talk about or we've tried to focus on what are problems inside of Extinction Rebellion. And then we try to analyze what were the different goals that we could achieve. This is a non-exhaustive list of all the things that could be a barrier for your, um, your personal or your group, your activist group to face in order to be a little bit more inclusive and diverse. And if you see this list, I can tell you this is not a problem of the activist groups. This is a problem of our society. This is a problem of the world we're living into. And to the question, are our groups not inclusive and diverse? I can answer you after living for 15 years in Europe, are our societies in Europe inclusive and diverse? And after hearing to these very interesting <laughs> activists from Poland, I can tell you that there is the problem. So when you have this kind of toxicity within the people, many people will join some movements trying to achieve a change in what they believe it's important to solve. But sometimes due to some sort of tunnel vision, people might forget to look abroad and people might forget that they are not the victims of some sort of oppression or discrimination. And therefore, they will not take that as important inside of their groups. And this is the, this is the perspective that people need to start taking. So how can you get in there? Well, initially inside of Extinction Rebellion, what motivated me to get into the inclusion and diversity group was the fact that I kept listening to people saying, hey, I don't think we're diverse and inclusive. And I was like, listen, I'm here. And I've seen other people from many other nationalities or many other non-European uh, backgrounds participating in the demonstrations. But people keep telling, yes, but we're not inclusive and diverse enough. We're not inclusive and diverse enough. And what I realized is that in this kind of movements, there is a scale of priorities. And inside of Extinction Rebellion, the priority for most of the activists seems to be action, seems to be being on the streets, seems to be taking civil disobedience to stop the climate change situation and motivate governments and other people to join. So this scale of priorities creates the problem of people not being able to dedicate capacity into solving the inclusive inclusion and diversity problem. Another problem is self-education. Many people, when I show them this, they don't know half of, half of the words that are in there. Many people don't know what intersectionality is, what toxic masculinity could be. What, what white saviorism could be. And another problem is the public image and the reality inside of the movement, meaning that a lot of the critics that we get, including the first that I showed you from, um, from the UK, comes from people that didn't take the time or are not taking the time to participate inside of the movement to even understand if that's a real problem inside of the movement, which I can tell you it's in many ways different, but still a problem. And here are some uh, short um, examples 
of what you can do to try to solve these inclusion and diversity goals. And I would then maybe get deep into this when we join the separate rooms. So I would like to invite you all to join and I hope you will have a good session today. And that was my five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Diego, uh, also for being to the second, as I just heard your alarm clock. Um, and thank you for um, introducing a topic uh, in this learning exchange, which we also uh, take a focus within the European Democracy Network, which is inclusion uh, and diversity, uh, focusing on issues as uh, anti-racism, anti-discrimination, um, something um, that uh, we not, not only need to take into account, but it needs to be part of uh, in our movements if we want to be successful in promoting inclusion and diversity in our societies and participation in democracies that concerns everyone, whether citizens or non-citizens. So thank you uh, so much to all of you um, uh, for being in time, for uh, giving us um, a short picture of uh, the situation in, in your regions. Um, it was extremely great to hear from you, from also from the brave stories, um, especially to get first-hand information from you who's right in the midst of those stories and uh, also the drivers behind. Uh, and this is exactly with the European Democracy Network um, that we all will also try to continue to mobilize resources to also in future be able to support individual activists uh, and their stories. And with that, also uh, to provide more opportunities for bringing change.